gospel lesson for today is found in the book of Mark. <clears throat> Pardon me, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered to Jesus after they came up from Jerusalem and saw that some of the disciples were eating their bread with unholy hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thereby holding firmly to the traditions of their elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not at least eat unless they completely cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received as traditions to firmly hold, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper pots. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why are your disciples not walking in accordance with the traditions of the elders, but eat their bread with unholy hands? Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, for as it is written, These people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrine the commandments of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, give hold to the tradition of men. Jesus also said to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. After he called the crowd to him, again he said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand me. There is nothing outside of a person which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which come out of a person are that which defile the person. For from within, out of the hearts of people, come the evil thoughts, acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, acts of adultery, deed of greed, deeds of greed, wickedness, deceit, indecent behavior, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things, evil things, come from within and are the things that defile a person. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, bless this word today. It's another hard word. Inspire us with your presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, boy. What a lesson. We're back into the gospel, Mark. I'm kind of regretting this. I'd like to go back to the, uh, to the bread of life ones that we were in last week. This is a harsh lesson. You know, it does remind me, probably about a decade ago, I think we were at, uh, at uh, um, a 4th of July up in Butler County, and I saw a woman who was wearing a t-shirt that said, I'm judging you. It was awesome. I'm judging you. Hey, we actually judge each other all the time, but people use this phrase and say, well, the Bible says not to judge. Well, you need to understand that there's a couple of different ways that we use the word judging. And we need to use the word judging the way the Bible does. We judge all the time. It's okay. It's not wrong. Every time I look at you, I'm judging you. Uh, depending on how, it, again, if I'm using it as a word discernment, I look at you, I'm ascertaining whether your character and determining whether or not I can trust you with certain things. That is actually okay. Discernment. I'm judging you. I'm discerning whether I can trust you to babysit my kids. I think that's a good judgment to make, right? There is no way I would have ever left my daughter when she was younger with certain people who really wanted to babysit her in the church. I was judging them to determine whether or not I could trust them with her. That is not what the Bible is talking about. What the Bible is talking about when it talks about judgment is I am determining whether or not you belong in God's kingdom. That is not okay. You do not have any right to determine whether a person does or does not belong in God's kingdom or will or will not be in God's kingdom. That's the type of special judgment that God is talking about that Jesus is talking about in today's lesson and which Jesus is condemning. It's what's called pharisaical legalisms that Jesus is judging in today's lesson. He's saying that these things are wrong. When you look at somebody and they don't fulfill your traditions and you therefore judge them and assign them to hell, that is wrong. That's the type of judgment Jesus is condemning today. He is condemning the type of judging that uses human-made traditions as a standard by which a person has or has not a relationship with God. And so let's talk about these pharisaical legalisms. This is what uh, Mark was trying to explain. 
See, the, the Jews were so afraid of breaking God's law that they created their own rules and regulations, things that they would not disobey. These are human-made traditions were called the hedge around the law. And hedges in themselves are not bad. They're only bad when we insist that everybody else follows them and that they're somehow necessary for salvation. So let me throw, uh, you know, we all have certain hedges that maybe we create about certain things. Alcohol, about dating, about gambling, about music, about literature. Uh, let me use a personal example about alcohol. I do drink two, one to two to three glasses of wine a week. Depends on the week. However, I can tell you for a fact, there are only certain days I drink them on because I've created a hedge around alcohol. We have alcoholics in our family. I don't want to give myself over to that. And so I have certain rules. I will only drink alcohol on my days off or the night I've worked and maybe I have a day off the next day. So that's the only days I will drink alcohol on my days off or on a special occasion that we're celebrating something with the family. That's, those are two rules right there. Hedges around alcohol for me. Those are not the only hedges around alcohol for me. I will also only drink one glass of alcohol anytime I have alcohol with exception of Christmas and Easter. I might have two on those days. Those are the only exceptions. I also have another regulation around my consumption of alcohol. I never drink alcohol if I feel I need a drink. Ever. No exception to that. Even on days off, okay, it's my day off, I can drink alcohol. Boy, I really feel the need to drink. I don't drink it. Won't. Because I don't want to give in to that. Now, that's for me. I'm not suggesting it for you. You do what you feel called for. That's fine. But if I were to insist that everybody consume alcohol in the same way I do, well, it might be a good policy. But that would be a pharisaical legalism if I said, you're disobeying God if you don't obey my rules. That's what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees judged people's relationship with God based upon whether or not they fulfilled their own human-made traditions. And legalisms, these pharisaical legalisms are a sign or of that a person is lacking in spiritual maturity. You don't trust yourself, and so therefore you don't trust other people, therefore you make up all the rules that they have to follow. And we define our parameters of how we think about people, whether or not they fulfill my rules and how I think their relationship with God should be lived. So these types of pharisaical legalisms, I hate to say, still alive, alive and well in the Church of Jesus Christ today in the United States of America. We don't trust the Holy Spirit to convict people and change people. And so we conflate our legalisms with the Word of God. I, I will tell you what, I have one person drive me crazy, but I, I refuse to interact with some of this type of stuff. If I were talking to him personally, I would. But he is just adamant that the, that the Bible says that the world was created in six literalistic days, 24-hour period, five to 6,000 years ago. And if you don't believe that, you can't go to heaven. That's literally, you don't believe in Jesus. It's a debatable point. The passages of Scripture to which he's referring are poetical passages. Genesis 1 is a poem. We don't interpret poetry in the same way that we interpret literalistic or literal narratives, historical narratives. So, if you were to insist that your way must be right and everybody else is wrong, you are a pharisaical legalist. You interpret it that way? Fine. But you cannot insist that I believe that if I'm going to be a Christian. You can't. You don't have a right. The only thing the Bible says is I must believe in Jesus. It doesn't say I have to believe in a literalistic six-day, 24-hour period of creation five, six thousand years ago. It's not what the Bible says, okay? People must develop their own relationship with God. It is not up to me to define 
the pattern or process by which a person can come into a deeper relationship, relationship with God. These very legalisms that we create to protect us may ultimately prevent somebody else from a walk with God. I can tell you, the more fundamentalistic Christians who are having their voice heard in the public theater in the United States today, the more it is driving people away from Jesus Christ. Because they are saying, you need to follow my way or you're not a Christian. And people are saying, then I'm not a Christian. And they're walking away from Jesus. We got to stop insisting on our legalistic manner of thinking as though it is the only way to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't trust ourselves, and so we don't trust others with freedom in Christ. And we insist on them following our ways. That's a legalistic Pharisaism. People who want to force people, oh, oh, let me, better yet. Oklahoma. Their director of education, the head of the Department of Education in Oklahoma, is demanding that every public school starts the day with prayer, otherwise they will lose their funding from the state of Oklahoma. I, I'm sorry, I, I find that really offensive. Because first of all, the guy's a, a Southern Baptist. Nothing wrong with that, being a Southern Baptist. Okay? But there are more Roman Catholics in this country than there are Southern Baptists. So what happens if you have a Roman Catholic teacher and he decides to teach his kids how to make the sign of the cross and how to genuflect before the cross before, church, uh, before school every day and all of a sudden I bet you that Baptist director of education in the state of Oklahoma said, that's not what I'm talking about because Catholics aren't Christians. Okay? He's bringing his his turf battle into the public schools. He wants to force people to pray. Where does, it, where does it say in the Bible that we're supposed to force people to pray? How does that teach Jesus? It doesn't. He's a pharisaical legalist. My statement to him, if I had the opportunity to meet him, is teach your own kids to pray at home or in your church. Right? Not in the public schools. Teachers don't need one more dang thing to do. Teach them how to read and write and how to do arithmetic. Don't teach them how to pray. I will do that with my own kids. Thank you very much. No offense, but I don't want them to pray like Southern Baptists. That's just me. But I'm not going to insist upon you praying like me. He should not be insisting that people pray like him. That's a, he doesn't trust people to teach their kids how to pray. We need to trust the Holy Spirit to convict and transform people's lives. We need to keep legalisms out of the church of Christ. We need to stop enforcing our rules and regulations upon people. We don't need human rules to force people to Christ. Now, we need rules to keep order. In the church, we need rules. But we need to make sure we understand the difference between God's rules and human-made rules. Don't look down at other churches that don't follow your rules or our rules. Don't look down on other Christians who create rules that they believe are necessary for their relationship with God, like mine, with my, my consumption of alcohol. Don't look down on people who don't have those same types of rules because none of those things are biblical. So here's what we need to do when we evaluate the things of our faith. Is the thing I am evaluating a matter of salvation? Am I looking at something that's a matter of salvation? Yes. If it is a matter of salvation, guess what? It's still not up to me to force that on people. That's up to God, the whole through the Holy Spirit, to transform a person. I cannot force that upon anybody. I.e., it's not in my department. So if there's something that has to do with salvation, I can offer it. I can tell you about God's love. Then I just back up and let the Holy Spirit convict you. If, that's not, if you feel like you have to force people to act a certain way, I am telling you, you do not believe in Jesus Christ and you don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
You don't know who the Holy Spirit is. So is it necessary for salvation? Yes, then let the Holy Spirit take care of it. It's not in your department. No, it's not having to do with salvation. Well, then skip to number two. Is it a matter that is necessary for ordering the congregation? Well, we have rules and regulations in our congregation. You go back to this alcohol thing. We actually have a rule in our congregation that we don't serve any type of alcohol in our building, with the exception of communion wine. Okay, that's the only exception. So we don't have beer making parties at our church. We don't have wine or alcohol at parties at our church. Just won't do it. And I know where that came from. It came back in World War II when many of our men came back so broken and crippled from the things that they had seen in the war. And many of them had given themselves over to alcoholism. And the church said, we out of compassion are making this rule that there's no alcohol served in this congregation in order to best bless and love these men, these broken men. I think it's a good thing as our church, we continue, but it's a, it's, it's a human-made rule, okay? I don't know if it's going to change someday. I, I, personally, I'm, I'm very happy with that. But it's just a human-made rule. So is it necessary for ordering the congregation? I think in our case it was. But we need to be very clear in communicating this rule that it is not a rule from God, and it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's just a means of keeping order and protecting those men who came broken home from the war, war, okay? And if we cannot explain the importance of it, then maybe we need to go down to number three. It's also true if it's not a matter necessary for the order of the congregation, we also need to go to number three. Look at number three. It's a personal preference. So if it's not necessary for salvation, if it is necessary for salvation, it's in God's department, you let the Holy Spirit take care of it. If it's, if it's necessary for the congregation, communicate it clearly. If it's not necessary for the ordering of our communication, then it's just your personal preference. It's called adiaphora, a non-essential. Then what we need to do is Find a means of respecting each other's preferences out of reverence for Christ. For evil comes from within a person, not from a person, not from uh, failing to follow legalisms instituted by people. That's what Jesus said. So I'm going to tell you last story about a wedding <laughs> 10 years ago, probably that pushed my buttons, okay? And I realized I was the problem. So we're doing this wedding, and you know, to me, wedding, when we get to the altar, and it, it, uh, uh, the, a wedding service is a worship service. God is present somehow. And um, so the bridal party <laughs> is coming into, to, towards the altar, and all of a sudden this rock music, dance music starts playing. I can't remember what it was. Not a typical piece that you would hear in a church. And the bridal party starts dancing like this and jumping up and down as they're coming towards the altar. And ooh, the hair on the neck of my back of my neck just got raised and the claws came out. I'm like, they're doing this in church? And I had to compose myself and get through the service. The service itself was beautiful. And they were very receptive to the message that I preached that day. But I had to stop and think about this. What was really so wrong with them dancing down the aisle when they were coming to the aisle for the worship service? Is that really something that the Bible says they shouldn't have done? No. Well, it was a secular song. But once the, the, once the apostolic greeting, which indicates the start of our worship service, began, everything was worshipful until they recessed the end of the service, the benediction, they recessed down the aisle. So I, 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 I had to transform my way of thinking, okay? I was a pharisaical legalist. And I had my legalisms challenged that day by this couple. I'm glad they did. I, I actually now, their 
walking down the aisle in that way challenged my way of thinking about wedding services. So now I've got a new legalism. Once the benediction starts, once they do the benediction, from there until, uh, and, and once the, I'm sorry, apostolic greeting, name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, once the apostolic greeting until the benediction, go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be God, well, amen, and, and then the, the, the blessing on, on the way out. Between those, that's worship. There are certain things that we do are related to God. We don't do those things during that. But afterwards and beforehand, I don't care. I really don't care. If it brings them joy, good for them. And you do it in the house of God, good for them, because what better place to do it in the presence of God? Right? I don't know. You may disagree with me. But the point is, is that we need to be careful about imposing our legalistic way of life upon other people. That's a judgment that Jesus will not tolerate. The only thing that matters is salvation the gift of God's love. And you cannot force people to believe. That's in the spirits department. Everything else, not really all that important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this word for today. Uh, I got my legalisms and hang-ups about faith and about my relationship with you and how judgmental I am of other people who don't follow my way. You know, God, it's not about following Dave Jones' way because, honestly, I'm a pharisaical legalist. Help me to be more loving and kind and just to understand that it's the Spirit that brings people to deeper relationship with God. Those things of salvation are not things that I control. I just offer Help us to offer the love of God to this world. And I get out of the way of your Holy Spirit to convict and transform people's lives. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.